Namaste and good afternoon. Welcome to the NICE Economic Lecture Series. Uh, through NICE Economic Lecture Series, we aim to invite eminent economists to discuss the contemporary economic issues. Before we start, let me briefly introduce NICE. Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement is a research think tank registered under the Companies Act 2006 of Nepal working towards bringing research excellence in the field of international relations, international economy, security, and development, and looking for better approaches for enhanced international cooperation and relations for a better, peaceful, and stable world. To talk about today's important issues, Bangladesh's upcoming LDC graduation, implications, challenges, and the way forward, we have Professor Mustafizur Rahman from the Center for Policy Dialogue, Dhaka. Professor Mustafizur Rahman is a, currently serving as Distinguished Fellow at the Center for Policy Dialogue, a leading think tank in South Asia. Prior to this, he was Executive Director of the Center for Policy Dialogue from 2007 to 2017. Professor Rahman started his career as an Assistant Professor at the Department of Accounting and International Systems of the Faculty of Business Studies, University of Dhaka. He was awarded the prestigious Ibrahim Memorial Gold Medal by the University of Dhaka for excellence in research. Professor Rahman is a member of the Dhaka University Senate. He is a member of the Board of Trustee and Syndicate member of the Bragg University. He did his master's in economics with distinction from the Kharkov State University, Ukraine, and PhD in development economics from Moscow State University, Russia. His PhD dissertation deal to its issues of structural impediments to Bangladesh economic growth. He has continued to remain interested in these uh, and related themes, particularly from the perspective of designing appropriate policies and addressing implementation related challenges in developing countries context. At the same time, his academic interest and professional pursuits have led him to range of other areas of contemporary relevance to Bangladesh and other low-income economies in national, regional, and global setting. Professor Rahman has undertaken postdoctoral research at several reputed academic institutions, including the University of Oxford, UK in 1994, and the Institute of South Asian Studies, Singapore in 1998 as visiting fellow, Yale University, the USA in 2003 as a senior Fulbright fellow, and Warwick University, the UK in 2006 as postdoctoral fellow. Professor Rahman has carried out research work in collaboration with a number of international organizations and institutions, including the UNDP, UNCTAD, UNSCAP, the World Bank, ADB, Overseas Development Institutes, London, RIS, New Delhi, WTO Secretariat, IDRC Canada, Commonwealth Secretariat European Commission, and the ILO, among others. Professor Rahman's areas of current research interest include Bangladesh fiscal monetary policies and macroeconomic performance, trade policies and trade reforms, globalization, uh, regionalization, and regional trading arrangements, connecting in the Southern Asian region, WTO, multilateral trading systems, and interest of low-income countries, implementation challenges of sustainable development goals in Bangladesh, and graduation challenges of the LDCs. He has published widely in professional journals, both in Bangladesh and abroad, and has authored book, books and monographs in areas of interest and expertise. Dr. Rahman is a series editor of South Asian Economic Policy Studies published by Springer and a member of the editorial board of the Rising Powers and Global Governance Turkey. At different points in, the in time, Professor Rahman has served as a member of various important national bodies and committees set up by the government of Bangladesh. These include WTO Advisory Committee, National Coal Policy Review Committee, Regulatory Reforms Commission, Committee to Review National Sustainable Development Strategy, National Task Force to monitor the impact of global financial crisis, Consultative Group of the Economic Relations Divisions, Core Committee on Transit and Connectivity, and Study Team of BCIM Economic Corridor. He is a member of the advisory committee of the National Human Development Report. Dr. Rahman has served as a member of the panel of economists for Bangladesh sixth and seventh five-year plans, and was a member of the panel of experts for the second perspective plan of Bangladesh 2021 to 2041. 
He has served as a member of the T20 and G20 task force set up, by, set up to provide policy advice in view of the Japanese presidency of the G20 and has co-authored two policy briefs. He is a member of the core group of the citizens platform for SDGs and Bangladesh. SDGs Bangladesh. Professor Rahman, you have around 35 to 40 minutes to make your initial remarks and which will be followed by the question and answers. This session is of 60 minutes and the program is streaming live on several Facebook pages and social media platforms. And we would like to request all our participants to tweet about the event and also share our live video on this, their social media so that Maximum can, be, can benefit from the discussions. The audience can drop in their questions under Facebook Live or in Zoom chat. Uh, Professor Rahman, over to you. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Mr. Choudhury. It's uh, a privilege uh, to uh, share some of my thoughts on the theme that we have selected uh, for this uh, discussion. And uh, thank you for your very generous and elaborate uh, uh, introduction, which I sincerely appreciate. Uh, it's an opportunity uh, to uh, uh, discuss with uh, the audience uh, that we have, uh, a very rich audience, if we take uh, who have joined us directly and who are following us uh, on Facebook. So uh, I would like to um, register my deep appreciation uh, of your presence uh, uh, this morning. Uh, as uh, Mr. Choudhury has said, uh, I uh, represent uh, uh, Center for Policy Dialogue. Uh, it's a think tank in, in Dhaka, was set up in 1993 uh, by one of the eminent uh, economists in Bangladesh, Professor Rehman Subhan. And uh, we do uh, research on a range of issues. Uh, LDC graduation has been one of our key focus in recent times. And uh, indeed, I have also uh, prepared a report for our external resource uh, division, uh, uh, which uh, is uh, doing the negotiations in the context of uh, LDC graduation and uh, preparing um, uh, taking the preparatory steps for sustainable LDC graduation in, in, of Bangladesh. Uh, today's discussion is, is uh, important, uh, I think, uh, also because Nepal will also be graduating in 2026 at the same time with Bangladesh. In our region, Bhutan is to graduate in 2023. So for us, uh, I think today's topic uh, is not only important just for Bangladesh, although I have titled it Bangladesh's upcoming LDC graduation, implications, challenges, and the way forward, but I think that there are important lessons to be learned uh, for, for all of us. And we can learn from each other uh, in the regional context. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is an important discussion uh, for, for all of us in going forward and uh, ensuring that our LDC, upcoming LDC graduation uh, is sustainable, um, is with momentum and is, is smooth. So let me share. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Choudhury, uh, you, have you made me co-host? Yes, you can share with the screen. Okay, now I know host disabled participant screen sharing. Oh, let, let me see. Yeah, it's no. Can you can you try now? Yeah, I just uh, let me try once again. Yeah, now it's uh, it should be okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, you can. Yeah, we can see that. Okay, so let me. Okay. So, yeah, so this is uh, the title. Uh, and uh, let me. Uh, 
Okay, let me begin my, my presentation. As I was mentioning that uh, all uh, the salvation LDCs, uh, you know, uh, I think Afghanistan including, uh, which hopefully will also be eligible for graduation sometime in near future. But uh, three of our countries, it's uh, uh, important to remember that uh, we will be uh, uh, crossing an important threshold in our developmental journey very soon. Uh, in the case of Bangladesh, LDC graduation will be happening in 2026. We became for the first time eligible on all the three criteria, eligibility criteria of GNI per capita, of uh, human asset index, of, uh, of uh, economic vulnerability index, uh, the three criteria. Uh, Bangladesh became eligible in 2018, and then we were supposed to be graduating after two triennial reviews uh, in 2021 and 2024. Uh, but because of the COVID, the Bangladesh government uh, requested a two-year deferment, and we will be graduating not in 2024, but in 2026, just as Nepal has had also requested a two-year uh, deferment um, because of COVID. So 2026 is, is, is the date. And, the other, and I will discuss what are the implications for Bangladesh and it will be common for, for Nepal and Bhutan as well. Uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, I think what is also important, particularly for Bangladesh is that we are also making a second graduation, which is the middle income graduation. Bangladesh became, uh, uh, Bangladesh transitioned to, uh, lower middle income country from low income country in 2015. So, so this middle income graduation is also, also very important because it also has its own implications. Middle income graduation means that the cost of borrowing uh, will be growing. Uh, it's a uh, World Bank definition as distinct from LDC, uh, which is a UN definition. So this double graduation, you know, on the one hand, because of the middle income graduation, uh, access to uh, low uh, cost financing uh, will gradually erode and it will be mostly non-concessional loans uh, that uh, Bangladesh um, will have to uh, get and the LDC graduation, uh, which will have its own implications. So this is um, what we are talking about is how to have sustainable uh, dual graduation in the context of Bangladesh. Bangladesh became a member of uh, the LDC group in 1975. Uh, and uh, as I was mentioning, after 50 years, it would be uh, graduating in 2026. Uh, the LDC group, as you know, is, uh, was uh, uh, um, uh, identified as a substrata among the developing countries in 1971. It started with 25 LDCs. Until now, six LDCs um, have graduated, uh, but uh, many others uh, have joined uh, uh, after 1971. And today, as we speak, uh, 40, there are 46 LDCs. Uh, and uh, of these, uh, 16 uh, are slated for graduation at different stages. Uh, and of these 16, seven uh, will be uh, graduating um, very soon, uh, amongst which is, uh, is, is our three countries uh, from our South Asia, Bangladesh, Nepal, and Bhutan. Uh, so this is, uh, this is, as I was mentioning, is a very important uh, uh, point. Uh, now, uh, as I was mentioning that at the 2021 meeting of the Committee for Development Policy, uh, uh, in, uh, Nepal and Bangladesh uh, requested for deferment and uh, it was accepted uh, by the CDP. And then at the 40th plenary uh, of the 76th meeting of the UN General Assembly, um, Bangladesh, Nepal, and also another country from our region, Lao PDR, were recommended for graduation at the UN General Assembly. The final recommendation uh, is made by the UN General Assembly. So they have already uh, recommended um, our graduation. So sort of irreversible uh, journey that we have started with the UN endorsement of the C CDP uh, recommendation, okay. As I was mentioning, Bangladesh, uh, in fact, apart 
as distinct from uh, other graduating LDCs, Bangladesh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, was eligible in, in, in terms of uh, all the three criteria. Uh, uh, unlike other countries, you know, uh, which uh, uh, graduated either uh, double the uh, uh, per capita threshold or uh, two out of the three criteria. So, uh, but uh, as I said, Bangladesh uh, graduated in terms of all the three criteria, which speaks of the uh, attainments uh, over the last 50 years, but at the same time, as you'll be mentioning, uh, there are also uh, uh, challenges. Uh, 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 but on the other hand, uh, LDC graduation means that there is a good image, there is a branding of the country, if you uh, are wanting to attract uh, FDI, uh, the image uh, for the potential investors uh, when you are an LDC is, is something uh, different from when you are not an LDC or you have successfully graduated from the LDC. And also your credit rating goes up and uh, uh, hopefully that translates into uh, better conditions and conditionalities when you go for uh, uh, borrowings in the international market, for example. So, uh, but on the other hand, and that will be the uh, focus of discussion, that graduation, as the UN uh, resolution mentioned, successive resolutions mentioned, uh, that graduation is uh, not a destination, but a milestone in the journey of LDCs. Meaning that, uh, you know, with graduation, we have resolved many of the key challenges. That's not the case. It's a, it's a milestone. Uh, and that we will have to remember, and that our international partners will also have to have to remember. Uh, as I was mentioning, you know, uh, the, the seven uh, LDCs which are slated for graduation now, these are these include some of the important uh, economies uh, from the perspective of size of the population. Uh, just to say, the six uh, LDCs which have graduated so far. Uh, after 1971. If you take the total population, it will not be more than 6 million. Bangladesh itself is 170 million people. So that gives uh, an idea about, the, about uh, the, the importance of the current juncture that, uh, that uh, for the first time we are understanding uh, that uh, a sizable uh, number uh, in terms of uh, GDP, in terms of uh, export, import, you know, um, uh, goods and services, uh, size of population. So, so, so now uh, both the challenges uh, from our side, what the development partners can do, and at the same time, uh, 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 you know, uh, the opportunities uh, that, uh, that we can extract by not being an LDC. All these are coming uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to, 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 to a stage where it is becoming increasingly important, the issue of graduation. We'll have to remember that, that important countries are graduating uh, uh, in terms of economic strength. Also, I think one of the challenges is that uh, we are graduating in the shadow of the pandemic. The pandemic has had important implications for our economy. For Bangladesh, for example, before the pandemic, 20% of the population was below the poverty line. And then uh, in the context of the pandemic, another 15% uh, came down the uh, uh, poverty line. Uh, there were many uh, you know, challenges, uh, education, uh, health. Uh, um, in some countries, uh, there was uh, food security issues as, as well. Growth rates decelerated, export decelerated. There were important implications for labor market. That is one, the, the immediate you know, um, ongoing you know, uh, shadow of the pandemic. Also, graduation doesn't mean that the LDCs have been able to overcome, already overcome the many structural issues, uh, industrialization, the new economy versus the old economy, issues of inequality, distributional justice. All these are embedded weaknesses with which countries are graduating. So 
with graduation, we are crossing an important threshold in terms of the eligibility criteria, but the eligibility criteria do not include, for example, and it includes, for example, GNI uh, per capita, but it doesn't incl include what is the distribution of the GNI. So, uh, or, or literacy uh, or economic vulnerability, you know, all these are uh, average figures. So, so what I'm telling is that many of the LDCs, including my own country, are graduating with a number of structural impediments that are embedded in our developmental uh, praxis. Um, third is that we are also graduating at a time when the WTO is a much weakened organization. Um, and and we, I'm not going into those, uh, but just to say that the systemic issues have been are being questioned in the in the WTO by powerful countries, the operational modalities and uh, and decision making uh, uh, are coming under question. Uh, there is rise of protectionism all around, which uh, the WTO discipline is not being able to address. So we uh, and and we are we will be having the ministerial conference in 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 about uh, you know. 10 days from uh, 12th of uh, June to 15th of June in Geneva. And I myself uh, hope to be there. But uh, if you ask me, I am not very uh, you know, hopeful um, that, uh, that uh, the MC12 ministerial conference of the WTO will be able to take any important step in support of our sustainable LDC graduation. But we'll have to keep, keep fighting, no doubt. Uh, but uh, but what I'm telling is that along with the pandemic, along with the structural embedded weaknesses, we also have a global uh, multilateral system which is becoming increasingly weakened. Also, we know that the decadal uh, international program of action, which was uh, accepted in, in Istanbul, the Istanbul program of action 2011 and 2021, and we will be having and the fifth uh, um, uh, program of action and, and the international conference uh, in Doha um, in 2022. So we see that, uh, that the decisions that were taken uh, in, in Istanbul for the, for the decade, um, and then it was attended by, by the heads of governments uh, as distinct from the WTO where the trade ministers participate. So this decadal pro uh, program for, for in support of the LDC which take place every 10 years. So that program of action uh, also, if you ask me, was not uh, at all successful in supporting the, the LDCs. So that is also another important backdrop. The other one is the rise of the mega regionals in which uh, the LDCs are not participants. You know, Many of the LDCs are not participants, at least for, from our region the comprehensive and progressive trans-Pacific partnership, where, for example, Vietnam is a participant, RCEP, Regional uh, Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, signed in 2020, where Vietnam and, and, and ASEAN countries are participants. So what I'm telling is that many of our LDCs are not participants of the mega regionals, where the participating countries will be getting preferential access in each other's market. But we will have to enter these markets by paying uh, pretty high tariffs. So we are graduating at a time when we are disadvantaged in terms of market access. Okay, and I was mentioning some of the LDCs like Bangladesh are facing uh, uh, dual graduation, uh, LDC graduation, middle income graduation. Also, I think the politics of uh, graduation. I think I should uh, mention it uh, that uh, that uh, the criteria of HAI and EVI were fixed at 66 and above and 32 and below in 2012. Because one would have asked, you know, how come between 1971 and 2022, we have only six countries graduating and suddenly we have 16 countries, uh, LDCs graduating, eligible for graduation, you know, suddenly 16, how? Because the rules of the game was changed in 2012. And then you know many countries became became eligible, which would not have been eligible had it had the rules not been changed. You know, 
So, so the HAI and EVI used to be, you know, uh, 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 moving, moving numbers, you know, uh, in comparison to uh, other countries. Uh, but then the, the numbers were fixed in 2012. And, and if, you, you, if you are fixing a bar, many will be able to jump it. <laughs> but if you are shifting the bar up, many will not be able to jump. So simple. So, so suddenly 16 countries have become eligible. So we'll have to understand the, 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 the politics of uh, LDC graduation as well. Okay, now it's a fact of life. We will be graduating 2026. UNGA has already taken the decision and, and there is no uh, coming uh, back, you know. Okay, so going forward, what should be the strategies? I think that we should wear three hats because we have now three identities. We will have to think as an LDC also because Nepal and Bangladesh, for example, we have another 40 years you know, to take preparation. So, uh, and, and take advantage of the international support measures in place for the LDCs. So 40 years is also not a very small time. So LDC, we'll also have to think about as graduating LDCs that that we will be graduating in 2026. How do we, you know, uh, take advantage of uh, the the international support measures for the graduating LDCs? That is also very important, and I will come to that. What type of support is already there, and what we are seeking uh, uh, and as a, towards sustainable education. And the third identity is that we are, we have to think about as future developing country. So when we are uh, participating in the negotiations in the WTO, I would argue that, uh, that, uh, that we will also keep in mind our future as developing countries, because in the WTO, you know, we, till now we have been you know, participating as LDCs and then what are the special and differential treatment for the LDCs, et cetera. But we didn't think what are the special and differential treatment for the developing countries. So we will have to also think about that that whatever is being negotiated now will be implemented maybe four, five, six years down the line. And we as future developing country, we will have to you know, either take advantage or comply with those rules of the game. So participating in those uh, negotiations uh, with the perspective of a developing country will also be very, very important for us. Now, what do we, uh, stand to lose when we graduate out of the LDCs. And here I have uh, you know, presented in a schematic way that uh, we have many special and differential treatment that we enjoy as, a, as a LDCs, preferential market access, uh, unilateral schemes of various countries. For example, European Union, if Nepal exports uh, uh, to the European Union uh, uh, under the European Union's uh, scheme, uh, everything but arms, uh, whatever Nepal, Nepal exports is zero tariff. The importer gets an advantage uh, if it imports from Nepal, Bangladesh, because for example, ready-made garments, the uh, MFN tariffs, the, the average tariffs in European Union is 12%. But if they are importing from Nepal, zero tariff. If they're importing from Bangladesh, 12, you know, zero tariff. But if they are importing from Vietnam, India, Pakistan, you know, they will have to face the tariffs, this 12%. And the, that will not be there after we graduate. Although European Union has given us three more years after graduation. So it will start to hit in 2029, Nepal and Bangladesh. We also enjoy under bilateral FTA, you know, under regional groupings, bilateral FTAs, et cetera, et cetera. For example, under SAFTA, India provides zero tariff access for everything, uh, uh, excepting 25 items, liquor, arms, etc., uh, uh, to all the four LDCs. So beyond 2026, Bangladesh will not be receiving. Maybe Nepal and Bhutan will be receiving because uh, they also have bilateral FTA with, with India. But Bangladesh, if it doesn't sign an FTA or a, or a comprehensive economic partnership SEPA with India, it will be withdrawn. Uh, uh, the Indian concession will be withdrawn uh, beyond 2026. Then concessional finance, uh, uh, that is also something that uh, there is a window, aid for trade window of the WTO, for example. So that's, so all these uh, after graduation, 
uh, we will not uh, have access to preferential market access that we enjoy as LDCs uh, and, and other forms of special and differential treatment, which I will come to later. So, so uh, I have schematically you know, presented this, that uh, there will be implications in the domestic space, there will be implications also in the global space. And uh, in the domestic space, it will be domestic policy making that we get flexibility as an LDC, uh, obligations and compliance, you know, if we don't uh, comply with labor standards, environmental standards, you know, developed countries uh, sometimes look the other way, you know, it's an LDC, okay, we'll have to support them uh, and, and uh, there is no sanction. But once we graduate, those type of attitudes will very fast change. In the global space also, terms of market access, as was mentioning, zero tariff access that we enjoy in most of the countries, those will not be uh, available. And in our negotiations, it will mostly be uh, dominated by reciprocity uh, instead of non-reciprocity. Today, if European Union gives us zero, zero tariff access, they don't ask anything against it. But once we get into you know, uh, developing country status, obviously many of these will be on a reciprocal basis, give and take uh, basis, offer and request uh, list basis. So that will be the, uh, the, the challenges. As you was mentioning, in the WTO, we get uh, uh, you know, zero tariff access under, under the various uh, schemes which are notified in the WTO. Uh, uh, so, and, and there are other international support mechanisms in the form of many special and differential uh, treatment. In the WTO 16 main WTO agreements, there are 185 uh, uh, various special and differential treatment of which uh, 25 are exclusively for the LDCs. Uh, so those will not be there, the exclusive ones. For pharmaceuticals, we get derogation, you know, uh, uh, waivers in in the in the uh, services agreement, uh, flexibility in commitment of the trade facilitation agreement, extended period of implementation in the trips. All these are uh, special and differential status under the various WTO agreements, specifically targeted for the LDCs. Those will no more be available to us. Uh, also, uh, many obligations in the WTO, for example, the subsidies that we give, the compliance and obligations that we have to take, access to, for example, climate fund, the LDC fund, all these will gradually be, um, will, will not be there. And also, uh, I also uh, uh, would like to draw your uh, kind of attention to the fact that many of the ongoing negotiations in the WTO in support of the LDCs for which we have been fighting for many, many years uh, and, and have not been implemented, but may be implemented in four or five years. We will not be, uh, we, we have done the groundwork, but we will not be eligible uh, for, for those uh, LDC specific SNDTs. Eh? <laughs> so, so, and I have given some examples uh, of those uh, as well. Uh, now, in view of this, what do we want really? So we want that in view of the structural, embedded structural weaknesses, in view of the adverse implications on our export competitiveness when the market access will not be there, the zero tariff market access will not be there. In view of the loss of policy space that we are facing, we will be facing yeah, access to funds that we'll be facing. What we are trying to do is that, well, we will be graduating, but for the graduating LDCs, can we extend the international support measures for the LDCs for a time bound period, okay? For example, as I was mentioning, European Union has said that as a token of support to graduating LDCs, we will allow zero tariff for another three years after the LDCs graduate. So if you graduate in 2023 Bhutan, we'll give it to you till 2026. If Nepal and Bangladesh will be graduating in 2026, we will be providing you zero tariff access to 2029. So what we are wanting is that extension of the 
international support measures for the LDCs for 12, 12 years. We know that no one is going to give us for 12 years. We have now uh, brought down our ambition level. We are now asking six to nine, nine years as we go to uh, Geneva for the WTO ministerial meeting, we will be seeking six to nine, nine years, no, not the initial uh, bargaining <laughs> chip of, uh, of, of 12 years. Okay. And we are um, uh, asking that many of the LDCs are in, 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 in debt and can there be a debt relief initiative for the graduating LDCs, given that they will have to compete in a completely new, uh, new world. A competitive world. A graduation support fund, can, 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 can we establish a graduation support fund to enable LDCs take the necessary steps towards sustainable LDC graduation? Uh, so, so what we are wanting is, is a new international support, a set of international support measures for graduating LDCs. So that has been floated, is being discussed, if you ask me honestly, I'm not very, very hopeful, but, but maybe that, uh, that at least in terms of the market access, uh, 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 other countries may, may follow uh, what the European uh, uh, Union is, 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 has already offered. So that is something that, uh, that we, but we have powerful uh, um, argument uh, uh, in view of that pandemic, as I was mentioning, and they also that uh, the, the structural weaknesses and, and the implications of the LDC graduation for our exports when they will not receive. Um, and and so, so there are powerful measures. And also what I argue here is that, uh, that uh, uh, we do already have some embedded measures for the graduating LDCs. So it's not that it's, we are asking for something new. Uh, there are uh, already, for example, for the EIF, the, the Enhanced Integrated uh, Framework Fund, Aid for Trade, uh, uh, already uh, it, is, it is there that, uh, that uh, LDCs which will be graduating, they will receive uh, aid, uh, aid for Trade from the EIF fund, EIF uh, for, for five years. Technology bank for the LDCs, it is already there that, that LDCs, even after they graduate, they will continue to get support from the technology bank from, uh, for, for another five years. So I have given what are already embedded. When Maldives in our region was graduating, there was a special measure uh, that uh, Maldives will not be implementing TRIPS, trade-related intellectual property rights obligations from day one. They were given three uh, additional years. So it's not that when we are asking that, uh, that, uh, that we want a package of support for graduating LDCs, uh, that we are asking something which is uh, out of the box. WTO does have uh, uh, measures in place for, for, for the graduating LDCs. And sometimes it is said that some powerful countries I have heard telling that there is no category as graduating LDCs in the WTO, how can we even if we want to give, how can we give? There is no category in WTO. There are a category developing country, there is self-selected developed country, and we have LDCs. We don't have any category. We have seeds, small uh, island countries, developing countries, seeds. But we don't have any category as graduated, graduating LDCs. And what we are telling is that, you see, we are not creating another category. We are asking as LDCs which will be graduating. So we are not asking for a separate group of countries like graduating LDCs. We are LDCs, will be graduating. So LDCs are asking for some support towards their sustainable graduation. So we are not asking for any, any, any new uh, type of uh, uh, category within the uh, WTO. What they can do? They can give the, uh, the, the extension of the international uh, support measures uh, for six to nine uh, as a waiver, and WTO does have that system of uh, providing waiver. It can constitute a working group uh, which can submit the proposal at MC um, MC thirteen. So, so there are within the WTO there are uh, you know processes uh, through which we can get because many powerful countries say that 
we want to give, but 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 W two doesn't allow it. The procedures, etc. So that's not wholly tenable. Okay, um, and I also argue that uh, that as I was mentioning, three identities as LDCs, as graduating LDCs, and as future developing countries in W two and in the context of the in upcoming MC twelve. There are a number of negotiations where we have to participate, Nepal, Bangladesh, not only as LDCs, but what is there in the special and differential treatment for the developing countries. I think that we should uh, look uh, and, 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 and partner with India, South Africa, um, and, and others, uh, so that uh, as developing countries, our interests are safeguarded. Uh, agreement on agriculture. I'm not going to details, but but there are many provisions in agreement on fishery subsidies, um, uh, as regards which there will be perhaps uh, that will be one of the outcomes of the MC12 agreement on agriculture, uh, small agriculture, public stock holding. What will be the export um, exemption re restrictions? I think we have to keep our mind, keep in mind that we are future developing countries. How we can safeguard and secure our interests in these negotiations as future developing countries. I think that is very important for us. In Bangladesh, what are the preparations? I think in Nepal also, I know that is taking uh, various uh, preparatory steps. We are also. Or taking uh, our general economic division has prepared LDC graduation strategy early on the ongoing eight five year plan 2021 2025 is uh, is also uh, geared towards sustainable LDC graduation uh, the preparations that we need uh, the prime minister's office uh, has uh, set up a high level uh, LDC graduation uh, strategy committee uh, which has seven subcommittees and taking various uh, steps. Uh, so, so obviously, uh, uh, you know, some preparations are are, are ongoing in in, in Bangladesh, um, at least at the strategy level. But at the practical level, I think the transition is very important as regards uh, that uh, that we will have to make the transition, as I say, from market access driven competitiveness to skills and productivity driven competitiveness through the triangulation of trade, investment, and transport logistics connectivity. So that is in one line, I would like to formulate the strategy that we will have to take that the transition from preferential market access driven competitiveness to skills and productivity driven competitiveness so that graduation is smooth, graduation is with momentum, and graduation is sustainable. So theoretically, once we cross, at least for Bangladesh, <laughs> there is no coming back because there is a resolution in the WTO that no new LDC will have a population of more than 75 million people. <laughs> so Bangladesh, for Bangladesh, it is a one-way ticket. <laughs> it's irreversible. Uh, other countries theoretically can fall back. So this is uh, this is the agenda uh, that uh, I thought that you know strategic trade policy, strategic investment policies, you know attracting uh, FDI, uh, getting prepared for the uh, compliance, uh, uh, which will uh, in fact uh, go up. So so a lot of uh, preparatory steps, uh, um, as I was mentioning, because the challenge for Bangladesh is also that. Uh, that for for the transition that we will have to make and 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 the money that we will have to borrow that the cost of the money will also go up because of the second graduation so obviously it is becoming a major major uh, issue so some of the uh, you know uh, priority i think is is that uh, i think uh, technology and and uh, and uh, skills and productivity the shift from the traditional economy to the new economy, more digital based, more service oriented. And we'll have to remember that the competitiveness in goods is dependent on competitiveness in services, logistics, trade facilitation, because these are embedded in one another. So if we are just competitive at the enterprise level, but logistics is not good, trade facilitation is not good, we are not that the whole value chain will have to be competitive. That's the lesson. Um, but it has its challenges also, huh? jobless growth, 
you know, in countries like Bangladesh, obviously it's a, it's a major issue. I think that the next great uh, challenge for us, Nepal and, and, and Bhutan and Bangladesh will be, how do we get into the regional market from position of strength? I think that uh, within South Asia and within the broader Southern Asia, uh, which include ASEAN and East Asia, for example, Bangladesh total export uh, to, uh, to South Asia, South ASEAN countries and, and East Asia combined is only 12% of our export, only 12%. But this is Asian century. These are the countries where the demand is growing at a fast rate. These are the countries, India imports 400 billion, more than 400, 450 billion, more than 400. And Bangladesh's export is less than 2 billion on Nepal's export, you know. So I think supply side capacities and regional production networks and taking advantage of the transport linkages that we are now establishing. BBI and motor vehicle agreement, uh, you know, which covers also Nepal, Bangladesh, India, India, Bhutan. Uh, the rail uh, link that we are establishing with Nepal through Indian transit, uh, the access that uh, Bangladesh uh, is giving to, uh, to Nepal to, to Mongla and the third seaport that we are building, uh, Paira. So all these, I think the regional transport network. So what I'm telling is that the triangulation of trade, investment, connectivity, logistics, trade facilitation, and people to people. All these combined will can uh, help us to have a strengthened footprint in the regional market through establishment of value chains and, uh, and production networks. I was reading the World Bank report, the glass half full, if you have read it, exporting from Dhaka to Nepal is 1.5 times more costly than exporting from Dhaka to Sao Paulo. We cannot remain competitive, you know, and it's just not export. It is also import. If you can have lower cost for import, it's good for your, you know, producers, export-oriented industries, your consumers. So I think it's just not export. It's also import. How can you also facilitate import? So, and, and, and one point, and I'm coming to my conclusions, and one point is that the, the, we have to keep in mind that our, our graduation should be inclusive. In, in all our countries, I can see that in spite of the success, in spite of the meeting the eligibility criteria, unfortunately, the, there, is, uh, there is growing income inequality. There is uh, special dimensions of inequality in spite of the, you know, uh, uh, the averages that we, we talk about. So how can we make it more, um, uh, more inclusive? And the more inclusive, uh, you know, making it more inclusive will critically hinge on education, investing in education, investing in, 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 in the uh, new economy uh, where uh, uh, children from uh, the marginalized uh, uh, groups can participate because we see digital divide. We see, you know, that they are not they are, they have various structural impediments to participating in the new emerging economy that will dominate after say ten years. So, so I think that these issues of uh, uh, structurally embedded injustice will need to be. Um, uh, I think um, uh, we'll have to give more attention to that. And then I think uh, one issue that I want to leave and also for Nepal, that if we want to go for regional integration, we, our negotiating capacities will have to be enhanced. And what I have suggested is that Bangladesh set up a negotiating cell, like the WTO cell. As they say in the WTO, you know, uh, countries get not what they, deserve, but what they negotiate. So what are your offensive interests? What are your defensive interests? What are your non-negotiables? What are your offer lists? What are your you know, request lists? All these will have to be evidence-based and will have to be participated by the private sector. So I think that this is one capacity building which we, we lack and that is something that uh, that we will have to strengthen. So that is uh, uh, one parting shot that I wanted to uh, mention uh, because it will become more important. And also to, to, to deal with the cases, 
no 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 ldc was taken to the w2 dispute settlement body till now you know no one wants to take an ldc to there once you are you have graduated and become a, a developing country there will be many cases you know you have violated this you have violated that and 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 then this was not complied with these obligations were not adhered to and we will have to build up the legal capacities you know when i went to the uh, ministerial meeting in in hong kong i remember the us delegation was 460 people and out of that 250 were legal experts you know and when we go we don't have any uh, member in our delegation who are trade lawyers you know so that capacity i think is it will become very important as we go forward so with those uh, words i have i think i'm sorry mr choudhury i have taken a bit more time than i had intended to but yes, uh, thank you once again for giving me this opportunity and i will be happy to share any additional views in the context of the questions that you may have thank you uh, professor Eman, thank you so much for the comprehensive and interesting presentation on bangladesh upcoming ldc graduation implication challenges challenges and the way forward we have all learned a lot and we have also received a huge number of questions uh, let me share some questions from uh, first from the chat uh, that we have got from got here. Let me read out for you. Uh, these are questions from uh, Raj Shrikhar Mehta. Uh, in which way BIMSTEC can contribute in Bangladesh growth journey and whether BIMSTEC is considered in Bangladesh as complementary or contradictory to BRI? Is there a dead trap danger to Bangladesh vis a vis BRI like Sri Lanka, Pakistan, and Maldives? And what precautions Bangladesh is taking to avoid it? Thank you. Uh, OK, I can, uh, in fact, uh, 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 answer that. Uh, I think Mr. Mehta's uh, both the questions are, are very important. And not only for us, because uh, Nepal is also a member of the BIMSTEC. And, uh, uh, and uh, we know that, uh, that uh, 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 I thought that uh, Mr. Mehta will say that whether BIMSTEC is a contradiction with SAFTA, <laughs> but uh, I think he has given a twist that whether <laughs> what is his relationship with, uh, with, with BRI. Uh, no, I think that we thought that, you know, since BIMSTEC doesn't have Pakistan, which was, a, you know, uh, was an issue in, in, in SARC and SAFTA, so it will have a more faster track. Uh, and uh, uh, as you know, BIMSTEC also gives us an opportunity to, to have a footprint in ASEAN through Thailand and, and Myanmar. So we had high hopes. Unfortunately, uh, and let me be very frank, uh, uh, we haven't lived up to the promise that BIMSTEC uh, had. I was in, in Sri Lanka when the BIMSTEC uh, last summit was, was taking place. And, uh, we thought that at least after, you know, we mistake, it's celebrating 20, it has already celebrated, I think, 20, across 20 years. And the, the framework uh, FTA uh, was signed in around 2008. And we have been negotiating since then. And we could not come up with the FTA, you know, after 12 years of negotiation. So everyone is smart. Everyone wants to get into others market, but they want to protect their own market. So the give and take is also not there, just as in SAFTA, I would say. So unfortunately, I think that uh, that uh, that uh, BIMSTEC FTA, we thought that the, and one of the advantages of the BIMSTEC FTA was that it, it included both goods and services. And that was an important uh, uh, development. Uh, but uh, we even could not uh, do the goods uh, negotiations, unfortunately. But I heard uh, from my friends who are participating from the government officials that the FTA in goods is, is, is almost ready, if not the services. So that's uh, something. Um, and they have also, as you know, they have also reduced the number of areas from 14 to 7 and given each country the lead so hopefully these structural changes will also speed up 
some of the uh, some of the BIMSTEC negotiations that we are taking. Um, I don't think that a BIMSTEC will have a, any you know contradiction with regard to uh, BRI. Uh, many of these countries are, um, you know, uh, participating in, in, in the Belt and Road Initiatives, Bangladesh including, many of the Bangladesh pro projects are part of the, uh, part of the BRI. Uh, indeed, India was also, you know, in the, at the initial period, uh, India was also participating, for example, in the BCIM economic corridor, the Kolkata to Kunmi. Uh, corridor, but uh, it has stalled in in recent times. So I don't think that these are you know mutually exclusive or should be seen as a, as a one impinging on the other. Uh, so that will be my perspective with regard to the debt trap. I think very important uh, in the context of the uh, experience that Sri Lanka has gone. Bangladesh is you know apart from. In fact, you see, uh, the, the, often I hear that uh, you know the the Sri Lankan uh, debt problem is uh, originated from China, but uh, but it, mainly you know it's it's only thirteen percent of the Sri Lankan international debt is Chinese, forty seven percent is their sovereign bonds that they had raised. So that also created a lot of uh, a lot of problem for them and for us. I always say that uh, Bangladesh is not comparable, but we have a lot to learn, you know, from Sri Lankan experience. Bangladesh uh, debt, uh, outstanding debt is, uh, is only a small percentage of, uh, of GDP. Um, unlike Sri Lanka, we, which is 66%, Bangladesh is uh, way below that. And the debt servicing record of Bangladesh is also very good. But on the other hand, I see that we are taking a lot of new infrastructure loans from China, from other countries. Uh, some of these are supply, supply credit, you know, um, high cost, stringent conditionalities. So obviously, there are a lot to, to be careful about yes. what type of projects you are selecting. Are they good for money? What is the internal rate of return? What is the economic rate of return? What is the financial rate of return? You will have to calculate these very carefully because what happened in Sri Lanka is that they were taking the loans. Some of these were white uh, elephant projects, number one, not, not uh, no good returns. And also you'll have to strategize when it, you start to pay, you know? So, so you will have to know what are the reserves? Uh, how can we service? Whether it will come at one go? And unfortunately, I think in case of Sri Lanka, the the international scenario, the Ukraine war, uh, the tourists not coming. You know, they earn five billion dollars, and 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 forty percent of the tourists come from Ukraine and Russia. So all these also unfortunately common fund. But one will have to be very careful. Uh, I think for Nepal and Bangladesh. Uh, in order that uh, you are right, Mr. Mehta, that we do not fall into uh, into yep. debt trap, you know, debt servicing. What is your export of goods, services, remittances? What percentage you are paying for debt servicing? At what cost you are, you know, taking the loans? Whether you can recoup the uh, the loans from the services that you will sell? What will be the cost of the services if you? Bridge is not ten taka, but uh, you know twenty taka. Then, uh, then obviously your 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 cost of services that you will sell in order to recoup that money will be very high. And then your exporters will not be competitive. Your consumers will suffer. So one will have to be. I agree very very much that one will have to be very careful. Although, as I said, for Bangladesh, it's not a major problem as of now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ramha. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mehta. Mm, thank you, Professor. Uh, Abhinas, uh, do you want to ask questions or shall I read it out? Can you hear me? Yes. So yeah. I have two simple questions. Uh, the first question is like the economic growth of Bangladesh is mostly propelled by uh, the clothing industry. Uh, so uh, what alternative Bangladesh has once the clothing industry reaches its saturation? That's my first question. And the second question is, uh, 
how likely is radical Islam going to affect Bangladesh's economic progress? As we can see in the case of Pakistan, it has hampered a lot. So how uh, likely uh, this radical Islam will affect Bangladesh? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Avinash. When someone starts questions by telling simple questions, I always become alert because these turn out to be very difficult questions. But for first one uh, that you have mentioned, you know, RMG, uh, of course, ready-made garments is 80% of, uh, of Bangladesh's um, export. But let me also mention that if you look at the structure of Bangladesh economy and, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, the, the role of the export sector in the economy, one of the strengths I will say of Bangladesh economy is that it is still about 85% domestic market oriented economy. You see, ready-made garments is of course 82% of total export and that's very important for our you know, foreign exchange reserve, et cetera. But, uh, but, uh, but Bangladesh economy is, is, is a huge country, you know, 170 million people and a lot of domestic demand. So catering to the domestic demand and being able to be competitive in the domestic market is a strength for Bangladesh economy, you know? And having said that, you are very right, you know, uh, our, most of our export comes from ready-made garments, their employment implications, et cetera. 64% um, uh, of the employees now, you know, are, are women, it used to be 90%. So, so that has in important implications. And when the market access, preferential market access will not be there, they will be facing a lot of challenges. The WTO study shows that of all the potential trade losses that LDCs, graduating LDCs will suffer, you know, about 90% will be on account of Bangladesh because when our ready-made garments will not enjoy the preferential market access, you know. So obviously a lot of, but at the same time, we don't get any preferences in US market, but Bangladesh is the fourth largest, sometimes third largest in Vietnam, you know, when Bangladesh switches ranks. So, uh, so, so I think that it's on strong footing um, and, uh, and even if uh, the, uh, the preferences are not there, obviously there will be some implications, obviously, uh, but, uh, but uh, given the strength of the, uh, and, and, and our dominance in the, in the lower end of the demand curve, I think Bangladesh will be able to uh, sustain, but the necessary homework will have to be done just like Nepal also, I think. And uh, radical Islam, uh, yes, uh, that is uh, a very important uh, issue from political economy perspective. Um, the government is trying uh, its best in various ways uh, with, in, in, uh, in fighting radical Islam. Uh, on the one hand, taking it as a law and order uh, uh, case. And on the other hand, also trying to um, making in uh, you know uh, some sort of an understanding with more modest streams uh, of uh, of Islamist parties, you know. So it's pursuing, in fact, a dual strategy. Of course, some uh, radical people, <laughs> leftist people, um, who will tell that they, 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 the government should be you know pursuing a more of a strict secularist uh, uh, you know uh, policy. Uh, but I think the perspective of the government is that uh, in order to keep the you know, uh, fringe fundamentalists at bay, they will have to make uh, some concessions uh, or some understanding with the more moderate, uh, uh, you know, uh, moderate streams. So that's the two. Uh, till now, it, is, uh, it, it, it has been successful to do that. But if you ask me honestly, you know, going forward, uh, also uh, in one line, I would say that it will also depend on what we do. You know, if if we are able to be inclusive in our development, if we can take care of uh, you know distribution and justice and fairness, then they will uh, not have the you know the conducive environment where to rad radicalize. And if we can fail to do that then obviously there will be fertile ground for, for fringe extremists to make inroads 
into in, 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 into that uh, that space. So, on the one hand, our offensive, and on the other hand, what we are also doing ourselves in order to avoid, you know, that type of uh, possibility. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor. Uh, let me take up another questions. Uh, uh, this question from uh, Sandrika Pandit. Uh, his question is, is Nepal and Laos are in the same process of graduation along with Bangladesh? What Bangladesh is doing to work together with its peers to make voice stronger for extension of international support measures and other privileges? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pandit. I think that's very important, particularly in view of uh, the upcoming MC12, uh, as I was mentioning, 12th to 15th of June. Um, uh, um, Bangladesh is, is a very active player, uh, as also Nepal, uh, in the context of the uh, WTO negotiations. And uh, there is a, a, a you know, division of labor, in fact, amongst the uh, developing uh, uh, amongst the LDCs in, in Geneva uh, to pursue uh, this case uh, with various uh, powerful countries. Uh, we do have uh, support from the G90, the group of uh, developing countries, uh, which uh, are sympathetic to our demand, and uh, India also particularly, uh, South Africa. Uh, uh, and uh, but, uh, now I haven't seen in my various uh, interactions with the WTO and the Geneva missions, Lao PDR being very active um, because of you know many LDCs don't have even missions in 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 Geneva, you know, unlike for example Nepal, Bangladesh. So, uh, so I haven't seen Lao uh, PDR, uh, although it will also be graduating in 2026. Uh, but uh, Nepal, Bangladesh, uh, and, and some of the other um, uh, graduating LDCs are, are very actively uh, uh, pursuing uh, uh, this cause. Uh, as I said, there is a division of labor. Some is pursuing uh, in the context of trips uh, extension, you know, uh, for Bangladesh, it is very important. Pharmaceuticals is a major industry in, in, in Bangladesh. It's a $4 billion uh, domestic industry catering to 97% of our domestic medicine demand. We export to 130 countries, $160 million worth of medicines. And this trips uh, waiver uh, uh, that we don't have to buy patents and license uh, uh, under the waiver, that will be gone beyond 2026. So obviously, trips is important for us. Preferential market access is important for many of these countries, you know, Nepal and uh, and Bangladesh particularly. So we are, uh, uh, as I said, we have a division of labor, and our missions coordinate very closely in in Geneva to pursue. But I don't know because uh, you know because of the war. Ukraine Russia war because of the uh, ongoing price hike and 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 a lot of resources of developed countries being diverted to war efforts in 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 Ukraine uh, I am not very hopeful that the global environment is conducive for a new international support measure for graduating LDCs to be very honest so the need for preparation uh, has to be there and should be prioritized. At the same time, if we can get some extension, you know, um, I think that uh, like the European Union, I think that if we can argue the case, Canada is one country, I think, which will, I am hopeful that can give a you know, three-year extension because countries can give bilaterally and they just report to the WTO, you know, uh, under the NAMDUM clause. So uh, Japan is also a very friendly country for the LDCs. Uh, we can negotiate and, and request them. So, so I think that, uh, that uh, through those type of negotiations, the, at least the market access part uh, can be negotiated for certain some uh, uh, time limited extension. Uh, but um, but uh, as I said, uh, domestic 
uh, homework <laughs> should get priority at the end of the day. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Eman. Uh, I would like uh, Bishal Batrai to uh, like ask if you have any questions. Bishal, are you there? Uh, please unmute yourself. All right. Am I audible, sir? Yes. 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 My question is, uh, given the fact that Nepal and Bangladesh are benefiting from a lot of international support measures, as you mentioned, like preferential market access, zero tariff policies, a lot of soft loan measures and grant loans. Um, and once we graduate to a developing country, we'll have to live without all these benefits and international support measures. So is this graduation actually a punishment or a reward? And how can we ensure a smooth transition of this graduation, graduation process uh, by figuring out our vulnerabilities. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Bhattarai, Mr. Bishal Bhattarai. I think you see, uh, yes, uh, uh, sometimes uh, I hear that uh, if there are so many challenges, why do we need to graduate, you know? Whether it's a, it's a reward or a punishment, that's a very good way of uh, putting it. Uh, I think that, you see, there are certain criteria for being LDC, inclusion into the LDCs, and there are certain criteria for exclusion from the LDCs. So once you, in the process of your development, you cross at least two of the three criteria, you are automatically pushed out from the LDCs, whether you want it or not, you know? There has been many, some, not many, but some countries which were eligible to be included into the LDCs, but never, they, 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 they agreed, you know? For example, Zimbabwe. When Zimbabwe got uh, independent, it was eligible to be in the LDCs in terms of, you know, uh, uh, GNI per capita below, eh? Uh, EVI, HAI, they were, they fulfilled all the three criteria for inclusion. But they said that we don't want to be an LDC. We want to be a developing country. You know? So they didn't. Okay. So it's, so inclusion is voluntary. Exclusion is not voluntary. Exclusion is, <laughs> you have met two of the criteria you know, out of the three, GNI per capita, HAI index, 66 and above, and economic vulnerability index, 32 and below. They have, you know, their uh, measurement and they measure. And then you know, what you can do, you can conceal your data. And if you want to, you know, remain in the LDCs, you don't show it, etc. But they have their own methods of, uh, of, of calculation. And once you 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 are eligible, you know. Uh, either in as I was mentioning, there are two routes. One is that if your uh, per capita income is double the threshold, then if you don't meet uh, other two, also you you are eligible, or you are eligible out two out of three. Uh, Nepal has been eligible two out of three. I think Nepal, uh, in terms of uh, economic vulnerability index, Nepal has not crossed, uh, um, was not eligible, but under, uh, or per capita, I think. And per, so two of the three, Nepal was, uh, was eligible. And so Nepal is coming out. So, uh, so it's not uh, punishment. <laughs> it's because of the objective situation, your developmental progress. And to be very frank, you know, for example, if you ask Bangladesh, we have celebrated 50 years of independence of Bangladesh eh, last year in 2021. And, and we, 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 all of us, we were thinking 50 years enough, you know, Bangladesh should be now, no more BLDC. You know? There is also national pride also, you know. Uh, so, so I think that uh, looking at it, I think not as a reward or a punishment, but looking at it as a recognition of the growth trajectory that you have crossed, you know, so that uh, will be a better way of looking at it. But having said that, obviously, there will be challenges once you graduate, and the smart thing will be to do the homework in order 
to make, as you said, the, the, the graduation sustainable. And, uh, and the sustainability will, will, will depend on, you know, as I was mentioning, uh, what are the steps that you are taking today, you know, negotiating uh, regional agreements, participating more in the regional market, uh, uh, transitioning your labor market uh, from, you know, traditional economy to the new economy, you know, skills, productivity, uh, as I was mentioning, triangulation of investment, trade and connectivity, uh, value chains, so all these and, and also the reforms that we need to take, to be very frank, you know, in our countries, we have, we tend to avoid many of the, uh, you know, reforms, you know, so, so that, uh, so that is, uh, graduation will also, I think, give a, a, a trigger for, for, for the changes that we, we need to make, but, uh, but uh, let us look at it as a recognition of our, you know, <laughs> journey of development and, and uh, be proud of it and, uh, but be prepared as well for it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Professor Eman. Avinas, do you have any other questions? No, uh, actually the professor has already answered my question in, in this one. Okay, okay. Okay, then I will have, uh, I have one other question. Uh, I will read it out. Yeah, uh, the question is what it means for Bangladesh, uh, Nepal to join India in developing countries club. That's the one question. And that is, uh, there is one another question that, that will be the final question. How ready is Bangladesh for LDC, LDC graduations? Okay. Okay, thank you. I think that is a very uh, good way to end the discussion. Yes, uh, we will be um, in the same group uh, as, uh, mm, as India uh, in the group of the, uh, you know, uh, developing uh, countries. So it's, uh, I think it's, uh, it's a recognition of our national achievements also and but but also 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 a challenge as we are mentioning for example india huh? india is is a big economy it's it it's strength uh, is, is is in economic terms is also um, you know uh, quite formidable um, look at its structure of export huh? the uh, the most important export is is it related export you know out of 400 billion, you know, it's 150 billion is, is IT related. And look at uh, our export structure. Eh? Mostly it is, you know, lower end uh, uh, export of uh, clothing. Eh? So you see the, the structure of export is also telling us that to be in the league with India is, is will be quite challenging, you know. So the, and we will have to compete with India in the global market you know, at, at similar footing once we graduate, you know. So obviously uh, it's, uh, it's good to be in the same league, playing in the, in the, in the same, same league, um, uh, uh, but, uh, but at the same time, obviously it also speaks about the challenges that, uh, that we'll be facing because we'll be at par with the, uh, with the um, developing countries. I will give you just one example, you know, how one country is preparing for the world that is coming, Vietnam, you know. Vietnam has already signed a bilateral FTA with European Union. Not easy, because as I said, it will have to be reciprocal. So if you go, want to sign a bilateral FTA with, uh, with EU, you will have to comply with the EU's labor standard, you know, uh, uh, environmental standard, the, the ILO, uh, uh, all the, those eight core ILO and, and 27 ILO uh, uh, provisions and just not sign enforcement. So you see, it's, it's the way. I always say that, you know, now we are not paying 12% duty in European Union. In fact, the importer is not paying if it is importing from Bangladesh and Nepal. But Vietnam is paying 12% duty. But three, four years down the line, we will be paying 12% duty and Vietnam will not be paying the 12% duty. So the difference from current will be about 20, 22% of duty. You see? So, 
obviously you know to be in the league with india is is good but we will also look at india how it is going for various you know um, agreements huh? uh, it has a, a bilateral fta with asean it was almost going to be a member of the rcep huh? it it just but rcep said that its doors are open so so you see vietnam i was telling vietnam is a member of the trans pacific partnership giving it preferential access in canada it's a member of the rcep giving it preferential access in japan and australia and and korea so so you see so aggressively is pursuing regional agreements so obviously nepal and bangladesh how we can deepen our own regional sub regional and that's why i was mentioning about bbn motor vehicle agreement the rail link uh, you know through rohanpur and and, and that that we are now you know, trying to establish you know so all sub regional cooperation and uh, and and getting into various regional groupings comprehensive economic partnership with india you know uh, with asean all these will become very important so uh, so that is uh, something and uh, your uh, other question was uh, about bangladesh's uh, uh, preparedness is it yes. Yes. Yeah. How, yeah. Yeah. How it is? How we ready is Bangladesh? Yeah. Are we ready? Yeah. <laughs> ready or not? Yeah. Well, yeah. That's that's the um, I think the billion dollar question, and time will tell how uh, you know uh, whether you are ready or not. Uh, the 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 future will tell uh, once uh, these preferences and international support measures are not there but bangladesh is taking steps as i was mentioning our 8 five year plan has been designed as a as a uh, graduation preparedness plan okay because it will end in 2025 just before the the graduation and the prime minister's office has set up uh, various committees etc but uh, i think that uh, we will have to uh, many of the policies are there initiatives are there but implementation is 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 the issue um, skills productivity if you ask me i would say that the sector which should get priority you know the 10 sectors 1 to 9 will be education you know and <laughs> you choose your 10 and uh, because i think that the 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 changed you know scenario that is that is coming well, even if we get 5 6 years of extension of the you know the international support measures it will be quite different the economy that we are seeing now you know it will be more digital uh, more you know labor technology uh, avoiding uh, substituting you know that by capital intensive technologies its implications on distribution its implications on uh, you know um, labor market so all these will become uh, very important so uh, bangladesh is trying its best uh, i think but we can do better we can always do better and i think that bangladesh is uh, a bit slow in terms of pursuing regional uh, integration initiatives there are a lot of also resistance uh, from uh, you know private sector obviously but getting the whole of society and you know behind it uh, we are now for example we have uh, initiated uh, uh, already prepared the the draft for the sepa with india for example you know uh, so comprehensive economic partnership agreement with india so that's bangladesh is 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 uh, has prepared and the draft agreement it is now uh, it will be negotiated so this is the way to go forward i think that asean is also another issue in bangladesh we also think about joining rcep and just not asean you know rcep you know, which will give you access to 15 countries but then preparatory steps you know convincing the private sector because as i was mentioning it will be give and take you know so obviously we will also open up our own have to open up our own markets in order for us to get into other markets tariff reduction uh, you know trade facilitation 
So now all this, for example, BBIN motor vehicle agreement. So we have signed the agreement in 2015. And now already seven, seven years, we have not been able to operationalize it. Where are our border you know, crossing preparation, interoperability of the systems, single window, you know, so that our borders are not you know, choking points, control points, but are crossing points. So where are the you know, regional visa for people and the, and the vehicles? You know? So all these, we are very slow. So I would say that, the, so that uh, just not for Bangladesh, I think for Nepal, Bangladesh, you know, we will have to really speed up our, you know, uh, uh, the initiatives that we need to take. So on paper, preparations are <laughs> good in place in, in, in terms of many, many issues and, and aspects, but uh, I think that, uh, that some of the implementations we should have started yesterday, not tomorrow. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Rehman. We still have many questions, but due to time constraints, we are unable to take them all. Uh, uh, I would like to ask Raj Shekhar Mehta if you want to share something. Please unmute yourself. You'll have to unmute. Uh, let, 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 yeah, let me mute. Yeah, Professor uh, Lassie Pramita, can you unmute yourself? Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I am Ms. Mehta from India, and I'm the General Secretary of the Indus International Research Foundation, a think, think tank, who is dedicated for the regional cooperation. Uh, and I, am, I was very, very privileged to attend this, uh, uh, this talk. And thank you, Dr. Rahman, for a beautiful, very, very informative and very insightful talk. We are much benefited. And I also want to thank uh, Mr. Sunil Chaudhary for regularly organizing such excellent high quality talks. And uh, I, I took this opportunity to talk to you people that I wish to partner with you people for conducting more such talks, uh, especially dedicated to the regional cooperation connectivity, which is the, um, uh, which is the way forward because uh, South Asia is, is a region that has performed extremely poorly compared to all other regional groups. ASEAN is 30% inter uh, group trade. Even uh, 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 Sub-Saharan Africa is 22% and we are, our regional group is doing only 5%, less than 5%. Uh, we have to now get our acts together. And I am very happy that uh, uh, many things are moving. And I also want to compliment Bangladesh, who is the real uh, hero of the um, development effort. They have set example, they have set the uh, tone for South Asia. Excellent job, uh, excellent performance. For, we are all very proud of. Um, in India, all our think tanks are very, very proud of. Thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Chaudhary, please continue your good work and I will get in touch with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mr. Thank you. Mr. Mehta. Thank you for your kind words uh, uh, addressed to me and also my country. Uh, that's uh, very much appreciated. And I think that, uh, that uh, we cannot, you know, if we want to go fast, we work alone, but if we want to go far, we have to go together. And, uh, and I think that uh, there, India, uh, and the very good work, Mr. Mehta, you yourself uh, have been doing, uh, and your institution is, is very much appreciated. And thank you, Mr. Choudhury, for this opportunity. And uh, those who have uh, participated and those who have put questions, I think uh, that has also helped me uh, in really, you know, uh, thinking uh, about the possible uh, answers also. So this is also a learning process for us, uh, for me as well. Thank you. 
Finally, here we come to the end of the discussion. Thank you, Professor Rehman, for the insightful presentation. And we would like uh, we'd also like to thank our participants and audience for their wonderful questions. Uh, have a nice day and see you all at our upcoming events. Thank you very much. Thank you.